Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Let's get back to grid search. Uh, so, as we've seen um, uh, previously, uh, we we did uh, the feature imputation manually. Uh, it means that we, we took the original data frame, and for the missing values, we replaced them by the median on the whole data set. The problem here is that we have actually cheated, because before we did the train test split, we have used all the data set to compute the median. So maybe the information that was transferred by computing the median even on the test set was actually helping our model in an unfair way. So this is called what we call uh, data snooping. So it's using data that should not have been available uh, at modeling time. Um, so to check whether or not we actually this uh, cheating was actually helpful or not, um, we can use what we call a pipeline in scikit-learn where we will combine different stages as part of a single uh, model that will do both the pre-processing, the feature extraction, and uh, the, the training. And then we will cross-validate the whole pipeline so that we are sure that we are not uh, um, uh, cheating when we do the feature imputation because we will do the feature imputation on each validation set, on each training set for, for our cross-validation loop. So, um, Let's uh, try again uh, to do uh, uh, the, the to extract. We still need to work with uh, uh, numerical representation of the data as NumPy arrays for scikit-learn. So we will do exactly the same uh, feature extraction as we did previously, but this time instead of doing the the, the feature imputation um, using um, uh, the median. We will just use a fixed value of minus one for all the, the, the missing values. And it's just a marker because the, a person with an age of minus one doesn't mean anything. So it's just a marker to tell scikit-learn that, oh, there is a missing value here because the natural representation doesn't work. So we, we reuse exactly the same feature extraction, but this time we use minus one for the missing values. So we, are our numer we have the numerical uh, data frame as previously. And now we, we do the train test split before doing the actual uh, imputation, before computing the median. And we can use from scikit-learn preprocessing, from the scikit-learn preprocessing package, we import the, the imputer class. And this imputer class has different strategies to, to replace the missing values. So we use the median strategy as previously. You, could, you can also use the mean instead of the median. Uh, and in the future, we plan to have better strategies. Um, and we, say, we tell it uh, that any minus one value should be treated as a missing value. So we call fit on the training part of the model, and we then display the statistics that it's, it, it's collected on the, on the training part of the data set, not the model, on the data set. And so here you can see that uh, the second column uh, is the, uh, the age column, if I go back up, fair age. And so this time uh, I have a median value of 29. So it's actually slightly different. Um, but it depends on the train test split that I did. So, uh, so it should not, be, it's very close to the other value, so it should not help us too much. Uh, but we can check by uh, uh, going on. So in, once we have fitted the imputer on the training set, we can do the actual imputation by calling the transform method. So transform on, on this class takes the, the, input the input data with the missing values encoded as minus one and will return the same data and replace all the minus one values by the median for each column. And in, in, in this case, there is only missing values in the H column. So we can check that in the original X train, uh, there are some values that are minus one. But once we go through the imputation, there is no, no longer any uh, minus one value in, in this data. So it has been replaced automatically. 
uh, and we can do the same on the test. So here you can see that the imputer object was fitted on the train part and was then used on, to transform both the training set and the test set. But at no point we used the test set to, uh, to uh, learn anything because we, we learned only uh, on, on the training part. So this way we, sp we split the, the estimation stage from transformation when, when we have a transformation that depends on the estimation. So now that we have this uh, imputer object, we can uh, combine it with the classifier itself in a pipeline. So we create a new instance of our object with the same parameters. We recreate our a new instance of our boosted trees uh, with the same parameters as previously. And we combine the two together using this object, the pipeline object. Actually, in a recent scikit-learn versions, you could also do make pipeline instead. And I will do pipeline two equals make pipeline. It's, a, it's just, just a short end imputer. Uh, this way, it's, it's also creates a pipeline, but it's a, a, a nicer way to, to do it. Uh, when you create a pipeline manually using the pipeline class, you need to give a name to all, to each stage in, in the pipeline. Uh, so as a, as a string parameter. When you do that, it will use the class name uh, as, as the name of, of the pipeline. And it will add the suffix if there are two, two preprocessing stage with the, name, the same name. So here we, we call crossval score on the pipeline object that we created. And we pass the, the feature values that have the minus one uh, marker for the missing data. And for each cross-validation fold, uh, each of the five uh, iteration, it will call fit, transform, and then fit on that, and then predict on the whole stuff individually. And it will iterate this process over and over again five times. And th this way we know that the model has not cheated in any way because it has never used the test set values to, to do any preprocessing. And we can compare this, the score and we see that the score is actually the same as previously. And it makes sense because uh, a median of 28 or 29 doesn't in fact match the model. And so it's not a lot of information to know the, uh, the median edge of the person to help make good predictions. Uh, so, but it's a good sanity check to, uh, to uh, in general, to avoid uh, data snooping, to, to wrap all your preprocessing into a pipeline to, to make sure that you're not cheating. Um, so once we have a pipeline, what we can do is also do uh, cross-validation and grid search on the whole pipeline at once. So we did cross-validation previously, but now we can do grid search. And you can see that this time we define the grid of possible values for the parameters uh, by using names that are uh, compound uh, using this uh, underscore underscore um, uh, connector that connects the name of the pipeline stage and the name of the parameter. And so if you had another a pipeline inside the pipeline, you could repeat this underscore underscore separator. Yeah, so here I, I do not uh, grid search the learning rate. I could add it, but it's just too slow to compute if I... Uh, yes, if, if you don't include it, if you don't include a parameter, it will use the, the, the parameter that you set here for all the iterations. And so there we will try to evaluate uh, uh, gradient boosted trees with 0.5 uh, of the features and the max depth of three with the mean uh, strategy, then with the median, and we'll do all the combinations uh, of possible values. Uh, so we can do that and display the results. So you can see that it's quite slow. All right, let me change the resolution. Hopefully it's not too small. Uh, so now we can see that the, the top performing models, they have mean and median strategies. So apparently in that case, the, the kind of imputation that we do, if we impute by the mean age or the median age, doesn't change much. 
because anyway, the, the age of a population is approximately Gaussian distributed, so it's not a big difference. Uh, for other distribution, that might have a much wider impact. Uh, yes, you have a question? Uh, I'll come to you after. Uh, for make pipeline or for? Uh, you need to import it. So the, the errors that you, you imported it? Okay, so you, if you get an import error here, it means that the version of an account that, that you are using is slightly older, older than the, it, it, has the, it does not have the last release of scikit-learn. So you can just uh, conda update scikit-learn uh, and then restart uh, IPython and you should be able to get the latest version. This was uh, the make pipeline uh, helper was introduced in 0.15, I think. Uh, all right. So, so you can see that uh, this way, in this session, we used pandas to, to do data normalization preprocessing, and we can combine it with other pipelines uh, uh, for to, to to build a machine learning model. But we actually we haven't actually use pandas inside the pipeline itself. Uh, if you want to go further and, and do that, you can have a look at this project that makes it possible to have like preprocessing stage that you write with custom pandas code and it will wrap them into something that scikit-learn accept in a pipeline. And that makes it possible to, uh, to have uh, like a more maintainable code uh, over time. So it's called uh, sklearn pandas and provides you with additional helpers like, let me show you an example, like, like this, the data frame mapper object here. Let me make it slightly bigger. Uh, this class is a transformer. Uh, it takes uh, as arguments a list of uh, names and, uh, and transformer object. And basically what it will do is that whenever it, has, it receives a data frame as an input, if it has a column with the name pet, it will transform that column using this uh, transformer, scikit-learn transformer. Or you could write your own function to transform the column individually. So it means that it makes it possible to have like transformers for different types of uh, columns. Like if you have a, a column with a date, type, a date time type, um, like for a time series, you can transform that time that timestamp into uh, different columns. Like for instance, the, the day in the week, the, uh, the day in the month, or the month in the year. And this way you could extract different columns that would encode different per periodic events. Uh, so if you have categorical values, you can use the label binariz binarizer. If you have numerical values, you can use standard scalar to divide by the, the center, uh, no, to subtract the center and divide by the, uh, the standard deviation that normalizes the, the distribution of the, of the feature, and so on. And once you have this wrapped as a, as a data frame mapper, you can call fit transform on, on your data and it will uh, output NumPy arrays. So it's very useful to, to wrap your own preprocessing code in a scikit-learn pipeline. Uh, in the future, we plan to have better support for pandas in scikit-learn, but we will probably never introduce it as a dependency. But uh, at least it should be more natural to do this kind of preparation directly with scikit-learn. All right, so that, that's it for this, um, for this uh, part. And now, uh, I, for the, the rest of the, this uh, workshop, um, uh, we could either go further in, into analysis of uh, how the model uh, work and fail and uh, tackle uh, like more theoretical concerns like uh, overfitting and underfitting. Uh, other, uh, otherwise, we can have a look at uh, how to do uh, text mining, text, text processing uh, with text data. Uh, let's do a vote. Who, who is more interested in doing text classification and text data processing? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> uh, let's say 15. And uh, who wants to do the more theoretical uh, analysis overfitting and underfitting? Slightly less, I would say. <laughs> no? So let's, let's do tech stuff. 
anyway, uh, in all cases, um, if you go to uh, my GitHub account, or Grizzle, I, I tell it now because otherwise I'm not take it learn parallel ML tutorial. Uh, so, or Grizzle slash parallel parallel ML tutorial. So you have the notebooks uh, and all the solutions for this session. If you scroll down, you will see this, which is a, a video recording of the same tutorial that I gave at PyCon. And actually the parts that I cover in the three hour session that we did at PyCon are exactly the stuff that I didn't have time to cover today. So it's very complementary. So if you have the two videos, the, the one from this session and this, this one, you will have most of the, of the notebooks uh, covered. So it's, uh, the website is Parallel ML Tutorial. It's the name of the zip file. If you Google it, you'll find it. All right, so let's switch back to number seven, notebook number seven. So uh, first, a couple of import statements. By now, you should, you should be familiar with them. Uh, you can note the, the first one from future import division. It's to make this notebook behave the same under Python 2 and Python 3. Uh, so if you want, it's a good practice to do that, to write code that works for the two languages so that uh, in the future you can migrate all your code to Python 3 if it's in production uh, and you don't have to rewrite everything from scratch. I would advise you to run Python 3 from now on, uh, but sometimes you have dependencies that are not yet ported to Python 3. Uh, you can also put that to have uh, the same uh, behavior for divisions and, and uh, print functions. All right, so <coughs> text uh, classification and clustering. Uh, the problem with, with uh, text documents is that they are text documents and scikit-learn only accepts numerical description of the data. So how to, to do classification of text documents like spam or not spam or uh, classifying the topic of a news article or uh, trying to, uh, for, for instance, if you have a support system, uh, help desk and you have incoming requests from your user with uh, stack traces of errors of bugs how to uh, classify automatically the, uh, the the issues to route them to the the, the correct expert in, in your organization uh, to the person with the most expert in, in, in this uh, problem uh, so to, you you can do that by using a representation that we call the bag of words a representation um, so we will discuss this uh, feature vector extraction for text data. Uh, then we will see how to train a simple text classifier on, on this bag of words representation. And then we'll see how to wrap the feature extraction part and the classification part into a pipeline to have the two together as a text classification model. And finally, we will uh, discuss uh, cross-validation and model selection for, for this kind of beast. So here is a quick summary of all of the contents. So this is a, a piece of, uh, of Python code that does everything for, for text classification. So it first it loads a bunch of uh, data sets, uh, training and testing for uh, four possible categories, uh, four possible topics. So those are data from uh, 20 news groups data set and uh, some, some uh, discussion rooms are about religion, other about atheism, so it's very related. Uh, another room is about computer graphics, another which room is about uh, uh, space and, and science. Uh, so we collect this data, we uh, load them as Python strings, we, and then we apply this uh, TF IDF vectorizer to extract the back of front representation and convert that into a numerical representation matrices. Then we train a multinomial naive bias uh, classifier. And we then transform the test data and apply the, the classifier on that test data and compare it to the true labels and uh, to see the, the score of the classifier. So let's execute that. So it takes some time because parsing the text data takes some time. And you can see that on the training set, the, uh, the error is 95%, it's a 95% accuracy. And on the test set, it's uh, slightly uh, lower, 
it's 85% accuracy, but it's already quite good because uh, just guessing by chance will give, will give you 25% accuracy because you have four possible categories. Um, so uh, the, the, the goal of this station is to detail all the stages. So if we come back to the, the, the previous di diagram, you can see that we have this ro uh, native representation of the data, which are just text data, text files, or Python strings loaded in memory. The first stage is to call a vectorizer and to call the method fit, fit transform of, on this collection of text documents. It will extract a numerical representation, so a SciPy sparse matrix, matrix. I will detail what is a sparse matrix uh, later. Then we call fit on, the, on that uh, feature extractor, uh, extracted features. And we get the model. And for the new data, the new document, we extract the same representation using the same vectorizer as we did for the, for the training part. And we can call uh, the classifier on this new representation of, of the data. Uh, so let, let's see more detail. So you will have the problem of uh, under Windows, you need to put uh, uh, quotes here. So let me zoom a bit more. So if you add quotes around the path, it should work better under Windows. And you might need to get rid of that. So if you unzipped uh, the data from the, from the zip file that I gave you at the beginning of the session. You should have the data already downloaded in this data set uh, folder. If it's not the case, you can always do uh, run fetch data. And this, this uh, tiny Python script will check whether or not you already have the data and will download it if you, if you don't have it. So and it will also unzip the, the training use groups data set. So in, in this folder, you can see that we have all the original uh, data uh, training uh, uh, downloaded from the, the public website. And it has been uncompressed into two folders, train and test. Uh, this sentiment 140 and, and this other zip file are for uh, the next notebook. So you can ignore them for now. Um, so in this folder, in the train part, you can see many subfolders. And you have each, uh, for each subfolder, you have uh, uh, files that have uh, numerical names and no extensions. Uh, but those are text files uh, that were extracted from uh, the archive of public discussion groups uh, on the internet in the 80s or 90s. Um, and so they, those are the topics. So each folder has a specific topic. And in each folder, you have many files uh, from posts on, um, that were posted on these forums from the same topic. So let's use this utility from scikit-learn dataset to load the files by using the, the folder structure as categorical information. So it will treat the, the, the folder name as the target categories. And it will de decode uh, the text content using the Latin one uh, representation, which I think is approximately correct for those guys. Uh, in general, it's much better to know exactly the encoding that, uh, rather than guessing. So it's better to ask the, the people who produce the data which encoding they use to, to save it. Uh, so you can see that when we load this data, we have this object, uh, all 20 train. So it's all the 20 news group training data set. And we have this attribute target names uh, that are the names of uh, the possible categories. They match the folder names. Uh, if, we're, if we look at the target values, we have integers encoding. So the 12 uh, integers means the, the number 12 in that list may, might be uh, electronics, for instance. Um, we can have a look at the shape. Uh, so it's the target variable here. So we have uh, more than uh, 11,000 um, posts in this collection, in this training set, text document. And in the test set, it's slightly uh, lower. It's uh, a bit less than 800 and 8,000 uh, text documents. Have a question? 
Okay. So we, if we look at the data attribute, uh, this is actually a, a, a list of Python strings that have been loaded in memory. And so if we like look at the, the first element, you can see str. On your machine under Python 2, you might see Unicode instead. Yeah, because on Python 2, uh, we have the, uh, the str type means byte string, whereas in Python 3, the str type, it's Unicode string by default. Uh, and the bytes are a different type. Uh, so it's, in any case, you need to decode and have a, a Unicode representation, but on Python 3, it's called str. It's just the name that has changed. Um, so I can display, uh, uh, so this uh, utility function will take uh, the index of one document in my collection, in my data set, and it will display the name the, 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 of uh, the east eighth element of, that data, uh, of uh, the class of that um, uh, document and the, the text content of the document. So I can do that for the first document you can see that it's a document from the news group on uh, science electronics, and the text contents has some headers and a discussion about software, simplicity, purchasing, and stuff uh, from electronics. And then on the second uh, document, they have been shuffled. Uh, so you can see that it's uh, um, uh, an adder to, to sell something. Uh, they are speaking about, uh, yeah, I don't know. But it's for sale, it's for a, a, a advertisement. Um, so we, we know that the data is, uh, is uh, in Latin one representation. I, we, can, we can encode it in Latin one. So we, by looking at the length of all the strings in, this, in that collection, we can compute the, the memory size that is required just to, to store that. And we can see that uh, it's a uh, hundred megabytes of, of data. So just to have like a, an idea of the size of the training set that we are dealing with. So it's not that big, it fits in memory. There is no, no particular problem. Uh, if it didn't fit in memory, we would have crashed by now. Um, so on the test set, it's much smaller because there are fewer samples. So now how to extract the features from those text documents. The main class that we were going to use is called TFIDF vectorizer. Vectorizer is just a name that we use in scikit-learn to say that we we start from a, some input format and we extract vectors of features from 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 that data. TFIDF is the name of a normalization scheme that is very useful for text documents. Um, so let's uh, create an instance of that guy, and you can see that. It has many, many hyperparameters, many ways to tweak the behavior of the, the extraction of the, of the features. So we will just create, we, we will just use the default values for most of them. And MinDF, uh, yes, it's in a recent version of scikit-learn, MinDF equals one is the default value. Uh, it wasn't the case in previous version and just I, I fixed it to make sure that we have the same behavior for everybody. So if it's the same, you can just get rid of it. So we will use the default uh, behavior and call the fit transform method on the training part of the document, the text documents. And what we get as a result, so here you can see the person time magic is just uh, something to, to, to time the execution of that statement. It's actually quite useful, and you can see that it's less, less than a second to process uh, 100 megabytes or more of data. And the, the resulting data structure that we get is a SciPy sparse matrix. So a sparse matrix is a, um, a weird data structure that represents logically a NumPy array. It's a, it looks like a NumPy array. It has two dimensions, uh, some uh, 2,000 uh, rows and uh, uh, 34,000 columns. Uh, the values are floating point values, but there are only uh, much fewer stored elements uh, in, in that data structure because it doesn't store the zero values. So let me show what we should have gotten.
So if we, have, if we had used an umpire array and we had stored the zero values, we would have used uh, 79 million entries. And here we just have a couple of hundred uh, thousand entries. So it's much, it doesn't use a lot of memory compared to storing all the possible zeros that we would have get. So to understand the bag of word representation, uh, what it does internally, the, this vectorizer, is that for each line, or uh, each document, it will split <coughs> the, the text into individual words, and for each word, it would assign it a column. And so, um, in this matrix, I have uh, uh, 34,000 columns. So it means that there are 34,000 individual unique words in the whole corpus. And for each document, it will put a non-zero value for the words that appear in the, doc in the document. So it's likely that you have a short document with a couple of hundred words, for instance. So out of the 30, uh, 34,000 columns, just a few hundred will, will have non-zero values. And those non-zero values, they are basically based on the frequency, the number of times the word appear in that specific document. Uh, so you can see that the number of rows matches the number of documents that we have in this subsample of the data set. Actually, I'm working on a, on a subsample here um, to, to make it faster. So not the full training set. Um, and the number of features is the number of unique words that we found in, in the uh, text collection. Uh, the mapping with, between the column name and, and, the, um, and the uh, column indices, integer indices, is stored in, in, in a Python dictionary. So it's a very big Python dictionary because it has as many entries as there are columns, possible words. So I won't display it <laughs> on the notebook because uh, it would crash it. Uh, but you can have an idea of uh, the, the feature names, so the, all the possible uh, unique names, by looking at the, this uh, get feature names that returns an array of or list uh, of uh, all the strings that it found. And you can see that at the beginning, it's, it's sorted in, a, in lexicographical order. Uh, so at the beginning, there is a lot of garbage uh, with uh, digits at, at the beginning. And if we have a look at the middle of this collection, we have actual English names, Eng English words. And they have been normalized. They have been uh, put in, in lower case. And uh, there is no punctuation anymore. So what we can do uh, on, on this uh, uh, SciPass pass metrics is try to, do, to find a... Uh, um, a compression, a two-dimensional projection of that data into a two-dimensional space to visualize it. And to do th so, we use an algorithm which is called singular value decomposition. And we'll just look at the first two components that, of that decomposition and project each individual document of our corpus into that space. So we, we start from the big high-dimensional space with 34 dimensions, uh, 1,000 dimensions. And we compress the data into a two-dimensional space. And we try to preserve the layout from the original space into that space. Uh, of course, it's, it, we are losing a lot of information. So we are, comp we are compressing. So it's not a lossless transformation. Uh, and, but you can see that even if we compress a lot by doing so, uh, there, there are still like a layout where um, document about atheism and document about religion are in light blue and, and dark blue, respectively. Uh, you, you can see that they are in the lower hand of, of this space. And sci science space and computer graphics um, are interwined more in the upper side. And it makes sense because uh, religion and atheism, they share the, a lot of common words uh, to speak, uh, to talk about God, uh, whether you believe it, uh, in it or not. You are, you are using the same words. And uh, electronics and science, they are common words. So the, the topics are more similar. And it, it, this is actually reflected in, in this representation. But you can see that trying to, uh, to draw a line in that space, it, it would make it possible to separate a document that speaks from um, a religion from a document that speaks about uh, space. 
So I draw in a line here quite, quite, uh, quite well, actually. Uh, but there are still a lot of uh, overlap in the middle, so uh, we wouldn't have a, a good prediction accuracy by, by working in that space. But it's good to use uh, SVD projection just to have a look at the data and to get some intuition uh, about how the, the different classes are, are related. Uh, so let's try a first model. Uh, so we extract the target variable, and so we call it Y. And here we just have four classes. It's just a subset of the data. Uh, we check that the, uh, the, 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 the SciPass pass metrics that we extracted has the same dimension as the target variable for the first, uh, uh, for the number of samples. And we can train a multinomial naive bias model. So this model is very nice because it's simple. Uh, it has very few parameters. And basically, the only alpha is really important. And it's uh, some kind of regularizer, re regularization parameter that makes it uh, possible to adjust a trade-off between uh, memorization and, and simplicity of the model, expressiveness and simplicity. Um, so we train the model as usual by calling fit. So it's exactly the same API as random forest or logistic regression. And this model is really fast to train. Uh, and we can call, uh, we can transform the data set using the same vectorizer, the TF-IDF vectorizer with the default parameter. And we check that the, the, the sparse metrics that we get by vectorizing the test set uh, as the, the right number of uh, documents as we have for the labels. And we can compute the score of the prediction on the test set. And we see that on this small data set, uh, we have close to 90% accuracy. It's actually better than previously. But this is just a random a train test split, so it, it might depend. So we would need to do a cross-validation to make sure that uh, this is a, an accurate estimation. We can also compute the score of the model on the training set. And you can see uh, that the, the, the score, the accuracy on the training set is much better. And this is the case because the, the model was able to memorize all the training sets almost by heart. Uh, so in practice, we never evaluate the score of a model on the training set. But it's good sometimes to, to see if this score is not 100% and means that the model is too constrained and it might suffer from underfitting. Uh, if there is a big gap between the two, training score and test score, we say that there is overfitting. So this model is actually overfitting a bit because there is 10% difference between the two. Uh, so we can have a deeper look at how, how the TF-IDF vectorizer works internally. So here is the list of parameters. Uh, if you want to read the documentation for the meaning of the individual parameters, you can access the doc string of the object. Uh, in IPython, you can do that uh, also by doing so, using the, uh, the question mark. And you will see the documentation that opens up in a, a new window. And you have the, the meaning of all the, the parameters and their default values. OK. I will just put back back. OK. So you see uh, in, in important parameters, like uh, the kind of input that we feed to, to the data. Either we can pass uh, a list of file names, and it will open the files. Or we can just fi pass uh, already file objects, open file objects. Or we can pass the string content uh, that we fetch from, uh, for instance, a JSON API <laughs> that is not a file on the file system, for instance. Uh, and there are many, many parameters. Uh, we will explore some of them. Oops, sorry. So the first uh, component uh, of the vectorizer that we will have a look at is what we call the analyzer. I don't know if you, if you have a prior experience with uh, text indexing. Uh, for a full text search in, in, uh, in, in text engines, text search engine. Uh, if, especially if you use the Lucene or Solar or Elasticsearch uh, libraries or tools, 
they have this notion of analyzer. An analyzer is something that takes the original document, the original st string representation, and will uh, tokenize it and simplify it and extract uh, a normalized way uh, to deal with the data. Let me just. Okay. Uh, so this is basically the the kind of transformation that it's uh, doing on the data. So I can call the analyzer on a, a string, on an individual document, and see what it's doing to it. So here you can see, I love scikit-learn, this is a cool Python lib, uh, that first uh, it gets rid of uh, the first, the I, because it's a single letter word, so uh, words that are too short, they can be too noisy, so we, we get rid of them. Uh, then you can see that uh, Python uh, is now low, lower case, and the exclamation mark at the end has been stripped, and there is the column also, so the punctuation is removed, it's transforming to lower case, and actually it has split it, psyche it, and learn as two different individual worlds. So this is the default behavior, we can customize this, and to customize this, you can pass a, a, a custom preprocessor function which is actually uh, taking the original text and, and keeps it this way uh, to disable uh, the lower casing uh, because the default preprocessor does lower casing. Uh, and then uh, the token pattern parameter is a, a, a regular expression that says uh, which characters uh, should be considered as word characters or not to extract the, the words. And here you, s you see that I'm using backslash w and the hyphen sign, uh, which means that now I will not no longer split on the hyphen. And now I see, I love scikit-learn, this is a cool library. Uh, if I execute it, uh, scikit-learn is uh, a unique word and I haven't get rid of uh, the y here. Uh, because I do not exclude uh, single letter tokens. By default, uh, this regular expression uh, only considers uh, two letters word. All right. So the. So for instance, uh, in long in languages that don't have uh, word separators like uh, Chinese where uh, the, uh, the, I don't know the, what's the name of the letters. <laughs> yeah, so the, so yeah, basically the, the Chinese words, they can, they can be uh, um, uh, stuck together and you need a actual, actually another machine learning algorithm to know where to split. So there is a specific preprocessing that is required for, for, chi for Chinese, for segmentation of the sentences. For, for uh, Latin-based languages, you can just split on, on the white spaces and on the punctuation. Yes? Uh, and I see the end graph mentioned there, but no, uh, nothing about stemming. Is it bad? Uh, so you can actually put in the, in the token pattern, you can actually customize it even further. Uh, let me see if I do that in this notebook. No, maybe not. Uh, but Basically, you can you can stick any co Python callable for the preprocessor, the same for the tokenizer, and uh, additional uh, steps also uh, as arbitrary Python functions. So it would be possible to call an LTK uh, stemmer as an, a stage in, in this and to pass it as a stage for preprocessing the data before uh, uh, tokenizing or after tokenizing. Um, and so NLTK is a uh, Python library for uh, text processing, basically. Natural language, Natural language processing. And it, in, in particular, it has uh, models for uh, stemming. So stemming means um, extracting the root of a word. For instance, when you have a verb, you can have different endings and, and beginnings depending on, on the tense. Uh, and so you might want to normalize that to get rid of that, just to get the root of the verb. Uh, uh, to get the meaning of the verb and ignore how it's used in the, in the context. So it depends on the cases. Sometimes it's helpful to do stemming. Most of the time it's not <laughs> for classification. So, uh, and it's costly to do also. So sometimes when you want to be quick at processing, you, you don't want to do stemming just because it's too costly. Uh, yes? Yeah. Uh, and the other LTK has uh, similar functions like this one, right? 
Which one goes faster? Uh, so NLTK does, uh, does also tokenization and stuff like that. And it also does uh, text classification. It's also able to train uh, machine learning models. But the, the, the internal representation that it's using, it's uh, Python dictionaries instead of Cypher smart matrices, which means that it's gonna use a lot more memory and it's actually slower to process. Dealing with uh, Cypher smart matrices, like just numerical representation is much more compressed and faster to, to train models. And actually, an LTK can use scikit-learn models to train the models. So it's possible to use scikit-learn inside of NLTK, and it would also be possible to plug NLTK stemming or preprocessing inside the TF-IDF vectorizer here. So you can mix and match the two. Uh, uh, I can show you the documentation on the website the, of scikit-learn. Oh, no. Scikit-learn. Uh, so if you go to the documentation and you go to user guide, and then you look for feature extraction, uh, the next one. Nope. Uh, this is web. <laughs> ah, yeah. I don't know why my search didn't work. So, if you look for feature extraction uh, on the, the Scikit-Learn website, you have uh, uh, stuff to deal with uh, Python dictionaries. You have stuff about feature hashing, which is very interesting also, but we won't have time to cover today. And there is a, a section, a big section, about text feature extraction that goes into more details than what I'm presenting today. And there is actually an example here to use NLTK, I think. NLTK. So here, it's, it shows how to import the word tokenize, the tokenizer and the, limit, the limitizer based on WordNet from NLTK and to plug that as a custom Python class into the count vectorizer of scikit-learn. Uh, count vectorizer is an alternative to TF-IDF vectorizer. So you can actually combine the two together if you need it. And the best way is to, is to try and to cross-validate and see if it improves the accuracy of the model, and if not, just get rid of it because it's, it's too expensive. Uh, it depends on, on the data. Honestly, there is no, no generic uh, rule. Um, so, there is an exercise, but uh, I would like to go on because it's, uh, at, at what time should we, what time should we stop, by the way? Uh, uh, okay, so yeah, so I, I prefer to go on. Uh, yes, question? Uh, I think this is... Yeah, actually, this is the exercise. Uh, so you ca you can extract in grams. Uh, I don't know if it's there. Hmm. And I'm just executing it. Okay, I just uh, I just demonstrated before, so I'm I'm scrolling back up to the previous example. So yeah, I'm scrolling up until we reach the first training model that we we've seen. Uh, so here it is. I'm pretty sure it's gonna it's going to be covered later. So the question was how to extract n grams. The 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 answer is just to pass n grams range equals one and two. Uh, but I think we were gonna cover it later. Yeah, here. Um, no, not here, but later. Um, okay. So before, uh, after we will see how to, to cross-validate uh, the parameters from the feature vector vectorizer, and the classifier. But before going uh, to that point, I will just have a look at the the, the multinomial naive bias itself, the model itself. You can see that it has a parameter which is called alpha. It's called a smoothing parameter, and if you put it to zero, it has no smoothing. Uh, when you smooth a lot, it means that it will try to find simple models, 
And we don't, when you don't do any smoothing, it will mean that it, it will have more freedom to adapt to the training set. That if you give it too much freedom, it can overfit uh, the frequencies of the data of the training set and fail to generalize correctly. So this uh, smoothing parameter is important to, uh, to, uh, to grid search. And we can see in the solution for this exercise that we can use the grid search object as we did previously and bypassing different values of alpha and, and, and uh, running cross-validation to find the best value of alpha. So here, this notation uh, log space, numpy log space, is a quick uh, way to, uh, to generate a numpy array that goes from uh, 10 to the power minus uh, 3 to 10 to the power uh, 3 and extract seven steps between those two on the logarithmic space. So I'm training different values of alpha between um, that and that. And you can see the result that there is a trade-off. If, if alpha is too strong, uh, the score is really bad. If it's uh, too small, uh, actually the smallest value is the best in that case. <laughs> uh, so let, let's explore further. Uh, so one, for instance. It's still the best. So apparently smoothing is not helping in that case. All right, uh, this is weird. This is really weird. Uh, it's a log space. It's really weird. I had not noticed that before. <laughs> Oh no, actually the best score is uh, is actually here. Uh, yeah, it, it's not ordered, uh, I was wrong. It's, it wasn't ordered, so if I go back to minus three and three. So the best score is this guy, so the second one. So 0 0.01. Okay, so if you, if you don't smooth at all, you, the model starts to overfit. Okay, that makes sense. So you, you can use the learning curves, uh, uh, the validation curve from scikit-learn to do a plot of this uh, actual dependency on, of alpha. So here, this is doing exactly the same uh, as previously. For different values of alpha, it's computing the cross-validation score and uh, as, the red line, as the green line, and it's also measuring the training score uh, as the um, blue line. So you can see that if you don't do any smoothing, like very low alpha, uh, the train score is 100% accuracy. So it means that the model is able to perfectly memorize the data set. It will make no error on predicting a document it has seen in the past. But on new documents, it's only like 94% accurate. And if you do some smoothing, you can see that the training score is decreasing a bit, but the test score, which is the only score that we are really interested in, is increasing a bit. So it's actually good to constrain the model a bit so that it generalizes better to new data. Uh, but if you constrain it too much, you can see that this is decreasing. The training score is, is decreasing a, a lot stronger and the test score also because this is a kind of a upper bound on, on the test score. So when you have a large gap between the two, we say that the model is overfitting. And when the test score the training score is, is uh, decreasing too much, we say that the model is underfitting. So the two are problems. So we need to find a trade-off uh, between overfitting and underfitting. Overfitting is also uh, sometimes called uh, uh, a variance problem in statistical parlance, and underfitting is, is called a bias problem. The, 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 the model is too constrained. So here we can see that there is a trade-off and it's around that point. Uh, so alpha equals 0 0.001. So now that we have seen that alpha needs to be cross-validated, we can also study the impact of the uh, hyperparameters of, uh, of the uh, vectorizer on, on the model. And uh, we will, instead of using a naive bias uh, classifier, we will use a passive aggressive classifier, which is another kind of linear model. 
uh, that works well on, on, on uh, text data. So just to show that you can uh, switch the, uh, the classifiers, it shouldn't impact too much the results. So here we are uh, building a pipeline with min df equals one, max df equals 0 0.8. And uh, we, we enable uh, IDF vector uh, normalization of the data, the weighting. So max df means that we, we are gonna drop all the tokens that occur more than 80% of the time in the data set. So those are typically what we call stop words. Uh, for instance, uh, in English, you have the, a, what. Those words are not very informative because they are too frequent. So you can see them in uh, more than 80% of, of the text uh, that you would see. Uh, so you can get rid of those and don't extract features for, for those words. And min df is the opposite, is that we can strip words that occur less than three times, for instance, uh, in the whole data set. Because if you see it only three times, you cannot really know whether it's correlated uh, to a specific topic or not. So it's a way to get rid of features that are too noisy. Uh, so it's, uh, it's good to trim stuff that is too rare and stuff that is too frequent when you're doing text data. And this actually is very important to do in, in practice. So I will put it back here. And so my pipeline here now, I can cross-validate it directly as a whole. And here you can see that I am, I am reaching on average 86% uh, accuracy. And this is the standard error of the mean. Uh, you could uh, use the standard deviation if you prefer uh, this way. Um, <coughs> Uh, so you man, now we can uh, e evaluate uh, the impact, for instance, of this guy. If I put min df equals three here, does it or four? Does it improve? Uh, it actually decreased a bit, so it's uh, important not to drop too many words. If I drop two, this is better. Uh, so uh, instead of, of uh, tweaking the parameters manually like I did just uh, there and doing cross-validation manually, we can use a grid search TV again. And this time we can um, adjust the parameters of uh, min df, max df, uh, whether or not we use uh, IDF normalization and whether or not we use n-grams. So here the, the question, the previous question on how to use n-grams, if there is uh, an n-gram range parameter for the vectorizer, and this parameter takes a tuple, a pair of two integers. And this is the, uh, the minimum size of the uh, n-grams and the maximum size of the n-grams. So an n-gram is, for instance, if you have n equals two, it means that when you have a sentence like uh, the cat sat on the mat, uh, you will treat pairs of consecutive words as token. So the cat, you will co consider this as one feature. Uh, cat and sat, cat sat together, will be considered as one another, fe another feature, and so on. And each of those possible pairs that you observe in the training set, you will map them to a specific dimension in, in your space. And so by doing this, one and two means that individual words will count as features, and pairs of two consecutive words will also count as uh, other features independently. And so by doing one one here, I mean that I will just consider individual words, and this will uh, consider individual words and pairs of words, unigrams and bigrams. So let's run this grid search. Uh, here I use the verbose mode uh, to, to monitor the progress. Uh, the actual output of this is not very useful, but at least we, we see that it's doing something. Okay. So grid search can be quite slow, especially when you're doing with a lot of preprocessing because this is quite expensive. I think on, the, on this model, uh, training the model is actually very fast, uh, but uh, doing the preprocessing is the, the slowest stuff. So you can see that the best model that we found is uh, uh, a 96 percent accuracy, so it's very close to the default values that we found. So it said that using IDF is actually useful, 
uh, and then uh, using bar grams is not necessarily useful and using stop word is not useful uh, on this data set. Um, it's so, it, it depends in general. Uh, you can, what you can do is also uh, do GS uh, grid scores and you could see all the possible uh, combinations and you see that they are very close to one another so uh, it's not a big difference. Uh, they are not very impacting on, on, on this uh, data set. Uh, finally, uh, it's very interesting when you train a text classifier to introspect the model to understand uh, how it makes its decision. So to do that with the linear model that we've used, like passive aggressive classifier, all linear models in PyKetern, they have this COF attribute, underscore COF attribute, when you fit them. So first we fit the whole pipeline and we can access the, the different stages of the pipeline. The VEC object is the vectorizer and CLF is the classifier. Uh, from the web, web VEC object, we can ac access the get feature names arrays where, where we have the mapping between the feature order and the names uh, of the tokens. And from the classifier, we have the weights of, of the tokens, of the features. Uh, so by using feature weights and feature weights, we can see which features are the most disc discriminative words. So this is a, just a Python function to order by weight and display the names. And so for each class, it does that. So for atheism, you can see that the word atheism itself is very important. Uh, atheist is very important. Keys, uh, I don't know if there is a keys on the mailing list who is very into uh, atheism, that might be him. Uh, but there are also stuff like uh, the Bible, Winget, Silic, Silic, uh, what? Anger, Jaeger. Uh, Jaeger. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, the negative words are stuff that are completely not related to ICSM, but more to the other topics of the training set. In particular, you have graphics, space, Christian. <laughs> Apparently, the, the atheism don't speak about Christian so much. Uh, for computer graphics, uh, graphics, image, animation is very important. TIFF, the file format, video, and so on. And stuff that are not related, like Christian, Alaska, gastronomy. But so here you have to understand that each classifier classifies uh, graphics, for instance, versus atheism, religion, and space. So there is a bias. Uh, because the, the neutral class is not that neutral in that case. So it would be interesting to add additional data uh, from, uh, from the internet, like uh, ho the whole Wikipedia, as junk. And you classify your in te text of interest versus that junk to have like some more uh, less uh, opinionated negative weights, because otherwise uh, they, are, they really reflect uh, the, the, the other classes. Uh, if you have a, a, a friend whose name is Macbeth, that might cause problems uh, because, <laughs> uh, you know, because there are, there are frequencies in, in, in Shakespeare so that are not representative of the neutral ground. Uh, you can just uh, collect random stuff from the internet or, or Wikipedia. And, uh, yeah. Wikipedia is nice. It's, it's not that big, but it's, uh, it covers a lot of uh, different stuff. Uh, okay, so for religion, Christian, the beast, Hudson, I don't know what, food, and uh, Saturn is not really uh, uh, religious, apparently. So this way you can you can understand what your model is, is how your model is working, because basically when you, to make a classification, it will just pick up the word and multiply the number of times you see the word by those numbers, and and, and uh, see if it's below or above some threshold that you can access from the, from the model itself. So as we did previously, we can also compute metrics. So precision and recall. In this, in this case, this is more interesting because we have more than two classes. So uh, here you can see that it's highly precise for computer graphics and space and less precise for, uh, for uh, religion and atheism because those two classes are very close to one another. And we can actually check that by plotting the confusion metrics. And so we, the ordering is the same. So the first and the last one are 
uh, I say them in religion, and you can see that those elements, this, those off-diagonal off elements here, are confusion between religion and atheism because they are overlap a lot. Uh, whereas the others of diagonal elements, they are, they are not as strong. All right. Uh, so yes, this is the target names to be able to, uh, to understand the confusion matrix. Uh, all right, so if you have questions on this, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so what if the data doesn't fit into memory? Yeah. So the question is, what if the data doesn't fit in memory? In that case, you go to the next one, large-scale uh, text analytics. <laughs> 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 and then it's another one-hour <laughs> tutorial. So basically, uh, this covers what we call the hashing trick, which makes it possible, instead of using a, a Python dictionary to map the tokens to the dimension of your, of your matrix, you just ha use a hash function. And you will have collisions, but on average, it's not a big problem. Uh, and this is a really nice because this hash function, uh, it doesn't use any memory. Whereas the, the mapping, the explicit mapping from the text representation to the column numbers is very big if you have a big training set. Uh, and furthermore, this is stateless, which means that you can transform your data into the numerical representation in parallel. And, and then aggregate it all. So you can scale to a large cluster and, and compute hashed features in parallel on a big cluster and then aggregate all the data and, and fit linear models. At the end, the second part of this, it shows how to uh, train online models, uh, linear models that, that can fetch a bit of data, increment their internal states, their, their statistic estimates of the frequencies, of the weights, and so on. Then throw away that data, fetch the next one, and do that over and over again, so that you have a fixed memory usage uh, when you do that. Uh, and finally, it also shows how to train independent uh, linear model out of core in parallel on a cluster, and then to merge the coefficient from one time, uh, from time to time. Uh, and at some point, you will have a, a unique classifier that represents what you, con you, you did uh, on distributed on a cluster. Uh, yes, when you're using, the question is, when you're using a hashing, uh, can you uh, understand what the, the model uh, uh, did? Be uh, the problem is that the hashing is a one-way uh, hash function, typically, and so you, you cannot invert the meaning. So you would have to trace the, the mapping and store it somewhere to be able to interpret uh, the most likely uh, interpretation of uh, each column. But you can have collisions, so one column can, can be mapped from different uh, uh, worlds. But you would have to store that in a database or a file or something. Uh, we don't do it currently, uh, but it's not very complicated to, to uh, hack the code to, to record that somewhere. Uh, I know that Wapolo Habit does that, I think. Yeah. So uh, Wapolo Habit is a, a Microsoft uh, uh, C++ project for fitting these kind of linear models on an extremely large scale, and it does the hashing trick, and it does the trace of uh, feature mapping. And it's uh, very fast. Uh, so if you're working with text data or streaming data, it's, uh, it's very nice. But there is no good Python API, because uh, it works directly with the file system or with the streams, because it's very low level to be fast. But this is an inconvenience, because you cannot use NumPy and SciPy easily. You cannot do Matplotlib easily. So it's pro and con. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's also in C and C++. And I don't know if John Langford will, re will see that video, but <laughs> I've tried to read the C++ code, and there is very few comments in it. <laughs> it's really hard to, to understand what it's doing. Maybe it has improved, because l last time I, I read the code, it was uh, five years ago. So. OK, it's still so difficult. Let's take, uh, let's take one more question, and then after that, whoever is interested, just huddle up here, and we'll continue the discussion, because I know some people want to go. One announcement I'd like to make uh, is, first of all, obviously, uh, thank Olivier and Brian and everybody who spoke yesterday. Um, if you liked what you saw yesterday and today, please go to HTTP kudos and give us some feedback so we can 
uh, get Joseph and Scott to pay for events like this. Um, <laughs> it really helps. We have to basically show them proof that people want it. If you didn't like it, don't go there. Don't, don't, don't. <laughs> but we will send out a, a short survey, Survey Monkey, give us feedback. Because we'd love to do this again, and we'd like to improve. So give us all the feedback uh, possible. So with that, let's take one more question. And after that, let's huddle up here for people who want to go. Yeah, so uh, for Sam, the event, generally, how big the data it can handle? Mm -hmm. So the question is, uh, how is it still working? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, what is the maximum size? Uh, the, the typical size of the data that you can uh, work with scikit-learn. So have you seen, like most of the model that we've been, dealt, we've, we've been dealing with uh, today, we, use the, we load the data as a NumPy array or as Pandas data frame or a SciPass parse matrix. And so we expect the whole training set to fit in memory. And it is, um, there, there are a couple of exceptions. Some of the models support partial fits, so online, modeling, uh, online learning. Uh, with incremental data. But then you have to do a lot of uh, boilerplate code to, to connect to your database or, or your hard drive or your network to stream the data. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the nice sweet spot for scikit-learn is to work with data that fits in memory. So I would say, depending on the algorithm, from a couple of megabytes to a couple of gigabytes or tens of gigabytes is the typical sweet spot. If you go uh, above, uh, yeah, you might. Uh, when you finish, I want yeah. to make a comment. Okay. Uh, you, you can have like big machines with a, a lot of RAM nowadays, so and uh, and and use that, and it's typically the, the sweet spot. If you want to to go to scale beyond, you have to move either to another framework or to combine Scikit-Learn with another framework like Spark or something. But it's not that easy to do. Yes, you want to comment on this? Testing. Uh, just another comment about that in terms of. Python is a general tool for large memory situations. Uh, last night, Olivier and I were playing on a server uh, that had 24 cores and half terabyte of RAM. And without any problem, we could create NumPy arrays with hundreds of gigabytes of memory, and it worked perfectly fine. The, the Python garbage collection detects when those uh, go out of scope, and they get cleaned up basically instantly. And on this particular machine, uh, the BLAST implementation was open BLAST that had multi-threaded support. So we could you know, diagonalize a, a massive matrix and instantly all 24 cores were being used. And so I think the real answer is what machine do you have, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's also very often the case that the, the big data you, that you have is the raw original format and that you, you would do a lot of pre-processing to do aggregate feature extraction. For instance, if you have a, a transaction log of individual user interaction with a web page, typically you want to extract uh, features that summarize a session of 30 minutes uh, of user interaction into a feature vector. And so this you can do using Hadoop, for instance, or Spark. And then from this sessionized data that it's much, much smaller, you can load it on a big, big machine with a lot of memory and do interactive data modeling there. So there is a trade-off between being able to quickly iterate when you do the modeling, quickly visualize the data, train a model, try something, uh, throw away an, an hypothesis, and the ability to use more data to, to build bigger, bigger and better model. So usually, if the data is too big, your, your speed of iteration at predi uh, building the predictive model will be lower, and you won't be able to, good, to, to create big models, uh, good models, because you, you would have not explored all the possible uh, strategies to, to, to build good models. So it's, it's good to be able to quickly uh, iterate. And so to do so, you can also just subsample the data and plot what we do, the learning curves. That, for instance, you, you, you use uh, 1,000 samples, 10,000 samples, 100,000 samples, and you, you plot the cross-validation accuracy of your best model for each of this data size, and you see how it increases. And it might be very well the case that with the feature that you have, there is no, no way to, to go beyond some, some plateau. And that rather than adding more samples, you should better build better features by uh, aggregating, enriching your data with external data set, like geographical data set from OpenStreetMap or stuff like that. that try to enrich rather than, than uh, add samples. So it's, it's good to, to, 
to, to do this kind of analysis before spending too much time on, on computation for nothing. All right, other question? Okay, so thank you very much again. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Music